Now that I've had the a7S III for a bit longer and actually have the final production model, I thought I'd append my initial review with some updates and tips I have from using the camera. Let's get undone. Gerald Undone. He's crazy. What's happening, everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and every breath you take, I'll be watching you. So let's start off with the easy stuff, the physical differences between this version and the one I reviewed. First up, there's no longer a Sony logo on the flip screen, so you don't have to worry about being triggered by being upside down when flipped over. Also, in my review, I mentioned that the dials were squeaky and the port doors were difficult to open, and neither one of those issues exist on any of my production versions. However, one of my cameras did have a sticky battery door that wouldn't spring open after unlocking. This seems to have resolved itself just by working it in after a day or two, and it was only an issue on one of the three bodies that I tested. The only other difference that I noticed wasn't physical, but an ISO setting. Now, I covered this one quite extensively in the picture profile and exposure guide that I just released last week for this camera. I recommend you watch that if you haven't yet. But the ISO where the camera switches over to the higher base is now at 12,800 instead of 16,000 in S-Log2 and S-Log3. I think this was a bug in the pre-production version because 12,800 makes a lot more sense because it lines up better with the other profiles that all switch to their second native ISO at 4.33 stops above base. But like I said, if you want more information on this, watch my other video. Also, in my review, I mentioned that this camera works digitally with the XLR K3M, and that would be an option for people that want to add XLR inputs to this camera. But at that point, I hadn't actually tested the quality of the K3M recordings against my current setup. So let's do that now. I'll switch back and forth between the K3M, which is sitting on my other Sony a7S III that's recording this very video, and my Zoom F6 over here using the Sennheiser MKH50 while I tell you about today's sponsor, Storyblocks. So you're working on a new piece called people wearing hats near water, and you've completed most of the principal shooting, but you just need a few more shots to really tie it together. But unfortunately, you're budgetarily or logistically restricted from picking those shots up. No worries, jump on Storyblocks and grab all the water hat footage you need. They've got a vast assortment of clips with unlimited downloads and 4K video, and best of all, they're royalty free for both personal and commercial use, so you can use them as much as you want, wherever you want. And they've recently just launched Maker, an easy to use video editing tool that allows members with an active subscription to edit their videos online within Storyblocks with direct access to templates, animations, and the entire library of Storyblocks assets. So if you think you could take advantage of a fantastic collection of quality stock footage and effects, check out Storyblocks using the link in the description below. For me, the K3M has two major advantages. I often live stream from here, and it's so much easier for syncing and for cabling to just run my mic into the camera instead of into my Zoom and then out to the camera. And when I do sync my Zoom F6 files to the camera in post, it's nice to have a decent scratch track to do that, and the included mic with the K3M does that job well. I did run into a pretty big issue with it though. When using the digital signal, you have three options. A 16-bit two-track option, a 24-bit two-track option, and a 24-bit four-track option. The 16-bit works fine and is the same when you record analog, but the 24-bit options do not work in the majority of the software I tried them in. It either comes back with static or no sound at all. This applies to DaVinci Resolve, Final Cut, Audition, QuickTime, VLC, and even Sony's own Catalyst Browse. Apparently, these files do work in the latest version of Premiere, however. I reached out to Sony to get an answer, and it seems that it has to do with the software not accepting 24-bit MP4 files, the video container that most Sony mirrorless cameras use. They said that the recordings are working as intended and the codec is fine, it's just a matter of waiting for software to adopt compatibility for it. I put this problem out there on Twitter and my Discord server, and some users came up with a solution using FFmpeg to wrap it in another container, like MOV or MKV, and when doing that, those programs I mentioned earlier stop having issues and your audio just comes back and works. Which explains why this isn't an issue in their bigger professional cameras, because they don't use MP4, they use the MXF container. So for now you have two options. If you want to use the XLR K3M and record internally, put it in 16-bit or analog mode, which means you won't be able to use four tracks, only two. If you do record 24-bit, you'll either have to rewrap using FFmpeg or edit in Premiere until other software develops compatibility for it. But according to the tech I spoke to at Sony, there currently isn't even an ETA on Kylos Browse being able to read the files. Alternatively, you can record externally to the Atomos Ninja 5 and solve all these problems at once, but we'll talk more about that a bit later. In the meantime, I have mixed feelings on the K3M for use on the a7S III. 
All right, now sticking with internal recording, let's talk about SD cards. In my review, I mentioned that some of my Sony Tough cards weren't working well. Well, they all do now, but I'm not sure if that has to do with the final firmware on the camera or the fact that all of my Sony Tough cards were recalled. If you're not aware, there's a recall on certain older Sony Tough SD cards. I'll put a link to the article in the description, but if you're affected, you can have your cards replaced at no cost. And if you're having issues with your cards on this camera or another camera, I recommend you do that because it's likely the culprit. So I unfortunately can't tell you what fixed the problem, but I can tell you that the new replacement cards work perfectly on the production version of this camera. But I also want to give you some card buying advice because I've tested several different brands of SD cards in all the different modes on this camera, and the results are a little complicated. So as you probably already know, there's different card speeds required for certain recording modes. And if we start from the bottom and work our way up, you can record 4K60 in XAVC-S or HS, so long GOP, H.264, H.265, on most of the V30 cards I tested, including my old favorites for the A7 III, the SanDisk V30s. However, the more expensive SanDisk UHS-2 cards, which don't have a V rating, but should be faster than V30, aren't accepted by this camera as anything higher than V30. So if you're using those, 4K60 with XAVCS is unfortunately your upper limit for them as well. But I no longer recommend buying SanDisk cards in 2020, especially not the UHS-2 versions. Next up are V60 cards, which can record up to 4K 120 in XAVCS or HS, and can also use S and Q mode up to 4K 60. But V60 cards are not capable of the all-intra codecs in any mode I tested. And I'm able to confirm that the Prograde V60 cards work, and so do the Sony Tough M V60 cards. And Terry Warfield, who actually beat me to publishing his SD card round up was able to confirm that the Lexar V60 cards work as well for the modes I just described. I'll link Terry's video below, go give him some love, he deserves it for being first. Next up, we've got V90 cards, which can do pretty much everything except for one specific mode. You can record all intra up to 60 frames per second, and you can do S and Q at 120p, but not both all intra and S and Q at 60p or higher. You can do all intra S and Q mode at 30p or lower though, just not up to 120p because that's reserved for the CF Express Type A cards. Now I have a theory about why this is. When you do all intra recording, the largest file size the camera will record is 600 megabits per second for 60p, which V90 cards can handle. But I think the reason why they can't handle the S and Q version is because that's actually sending 1200 megabits per second to the SD card before it gets slowed down to the final frame rate and stored at that corresponding bitrate. So for example, if you shoot 24p S and Q from 120 frames per second, I think the card needs to be able to accept 1200 megabits per second for the 120, but it'll slow it down and store it on the card permanently as 240 megabits per second for the 24p slow-mo. This is just a theory though, but it would explain why you need CF Express Type A for those modes, because V90 cards cap out at 720 megabits per second. Anyway, I tested the Prograde V90 cards and the Sony Tough G V90 cards, and both were perfectly for the modes they're fast enough for. So based on all that, which cards would I recommend? Well, if you're planning on recording all intra and you want a lot of runtime, the Prograde V90 cards are the best bang for the buck. They're the only cards that offer 256 gigabyte variants with two pack discounts, and they're 40% cheaper than Sony Tough cards when comparing the 128 gigabit versions. They're very high quality and perform great, and this is coming from somebody who has an entire collection of Sony Tough G cards, which I also think are great, but they're not as good a value as the Prograde's. And regarding those recording times for 24p all intra, you can expect just over an hour for every 128 gigabytes. Now, if you don't need all intra, but you still want 4K 120, I'd still stick with the Prograde cards, but I'd get the V60 versions and save some money. By the way, while we're talking codecs, something I didn't notice from my original review is that the XAVC HS codec doesn't have a 30p option for NTSC or 25p option for PAL. It does have 24p, but not 30. The XAVC S codec has all the frame rates, but I just thought you should be aware about those H265 limitations. All right, now let's talk about external recording. First off, I wanna clear something up that I didn't articulate well in my original review. You cannot record 4K 120 on the Atomos Ninja 5. In my review, I was trying to demonstrate that while I was recording 4K 120 internally in the camera, while simultaneously recording on the Ninja 5, I still had face and eye detection with no screen blackouts. But I didn't specify that the Ninja 5 drops that 4K 120 down to 4K 60. So I apologize for any confusion that caused. I'd also like to address all the requests for raw output testing. The only raw option supported on this camera is ProRes RAW, but I edit in DaVinci Resolve and absolutely love it but it doesn't support ProRes RAW. And I'm not gonna switch to Premiere or Final Cut just to use ProRes RAW, so it's disingenuous for me to give an opinion on it, since there's no way I can be anything but unenthusiastic about it, and that'll probably be unfair to Premiere or Final Cut users. So you won't find any ProRes RAW content on my channel until I can use it in the NLE of my choice. 
But when it comes to recording other formats in the Ninja 5, the experience has been great so far. I've actually noticed slightly better image quality when it comes to blocky noise artifacts in certain regions of an image. Overall, I wouldn't call this a reason to go out and buy Ninja. The difference is probably only like 1-2% to better, but I did notice it when pixel peeping. It just seems like a slightly less processed image. I also want to give a tip when it comes to setting up your HDMI output because I've been asked about this a few times already. You'll notice there's two output resolution options, one in the parent HDMI settings and then one deeper in under HDMI output settings. If you look closely at the icon beside them, you can see that the top directory one is for photo mode monitoring and playback. It sets the resolution when in that mode, where the more nested setting is for video and has the film strip icon next to it. This second one is the more important one and depending on the device, leaving it on auto may cause problems such as outputting the wrong frame rate. So you might have to go in there and manually set it to 2160p to get a proper 4K recording on an external device. Now lastly, coming full circle to the 24-bit K3M issue I was talking about earlier, another big advantage to recording externally is that the Ninja 5 records the MOV files and thus doesn't have the issue of 24-bit MP4s not being compatible because it doesn't use MP4. But something else you need to be aware of when it comes to recording externally is there's an audio sync problem between most Sony cameras and the Ninja 5 when the camera is at its default settings. To fix this, you have to go into your audio settings and change the audio out timing to lip sync instead of live. This might make it sound a bit delayed if you're monitoring with headphones, but it'll make your audio and video recorded on the Ninja 5 perfectly in sync and will not affect the sync of your internal recordings. So now I can record 24-bit audio from the K3M directly to the Ninja 5 over HDMI and it works perfectly and the video edits very smoothly thanks to the optimized codecs used by the Ninja. Of course, if you have the SD card speed and capacity, you can also record nicely optimized codecs straight into the SD card with the internal intro option. But if you're going to use the K3M unit, make sure you set it to 16-bit to prevent incompatibility with a lot of the software at this time. All right, now for the last few minutes of this video, I'd like to field some of your frequently asked questions on social and in the comments. The first one was this very interesting question I got last week asking which 1.1 times crop mode looks more stable, 60p with active stabilization or 120p with standard stabilization. This was a fun test. So for those of you that don't know, if you turn on active stabilization, the camera crops in by about 10%. It also crops in by 10% when shooting 120p, which thus locks you out of being able to use active stabilization because you can only use that 10% crop once. So this commenter wanted to know which of those two modes with similar framing will give a smoother looking shot when slowed down. I got Julie to do this test so that she could go in blind not knowing exactly what I was testing, just that I needed some 400mm slow-mo at 60p and 120p. And after reviewing the footage, I found two things. The 60p plus active mode still shows the small back and forth shakes, but it also tries to fight against her larger movements, which can cause these jerks and jumps when it's unable to do so. Where the 120p mode doesn't have this issue with standard stabilization because it's not trying to lock the shot off as much. So you get a bit more of a flowing movement. And when you add in the fact that 120p can be slowed down to 20% instead of the mere 40% of 60p, you get a smoother shot overall. Where I think active stabilization shines better is in vlogging situations and dealing with more of that walking bounce from follow shots and when doing locked off shots up to the 105 to 135 millimeter range. For longer focal lengths than that, you need to be careful that your more exaggerated movements don't cause the active stabilization to jump. All right, now let's answer some questions from Twitter. Something I'm noticing from scrolling through Twitter is that a lot of the questions here have already been answered by earlier portions of this video. So that's great. To those of you that asked those questions, thanks for submitting them. Hopefully the answers I gave earlier were sufficient. But I'm seeing one here from Thomas Haynes that says, can you externally record slash live stream that APS-C crop mode in 1080p that I've, heard that I've heard about? I have a special use case for that. So yes, you can. So for those of you that don't know, there's no APS-C crop mode in 4K on this camera because there just isn't enough megapixels. But in 1080p, you can use the APS-C crop mode. And yes, it does come out of the HDMI port and you can record it externally or live stream with it. Good question. I'm also seeing a lot of questions about different picture profiles and settings for low light and, and outside and stuff like that. For all those questions, I made a 49 minute answer to you and uploaded it last week. Make sure you check out the previous video on basically exposing and picture profiles and stuff for this camera that I already posted. Akil Patel says, coming from Super 35 sensors, can I use clear image zoom in 4K60 with APS-C lenses? How much will I compromise on quality? So the quality thing, I can't really speak to that. A lot of people think clear image zoom is, is magic, you know, but it also depends on the lens differences if you had a full frame lens versus APS-C lens comparison. But what I can tell you is that clear image zoom does work on this camera in 4K, even though the uh, APS-C mode doesn't, you can still use clear image zoom. But of course, when you put clear image zoom on, there are some restrictions in what you can do and can't do with the camera. So I probably wouldn't want to operate the camera like that full time. I probably wouldn't recommend that. But if you need to use it in a pinch for, you know, punching in or with a particular lens, 
It does work. Miles asks, can my question be in the video? Absolutely not. Question here from Luke that says, should a Panasonic S1 or future S5 user consider the A7S III or just stay Panasonic? I would say that the major decision there would be lenses and autofocus. If you need good autofocus, there's a huge difference in the A7S III and the Panasonic cameras and the amount of lenses that you can do that with. If you're not autofocusing at all, then you have a ton of lens options for Panasonic because you can just manually focus and you're not really restricted in that way. Because I still think the image coming out of the Panasonic S1 and S5 and those cameras is fantastic. So if you're just looking for a great image, I don't know that you're gonna get a huge improvement going to the A7S III, maybe a small one. But the big thing is going to be stuff like autofocus and solo shooting ergonomics and stuff like that. So I guess you got you to think what do you need most and is anything on the Panasonic holding you back that the Sony has? If not, you're still getting a great image of the Panasonic. May Williams, or maybe my Williams, apologies for the mispronunciation, asks, where has interval shooting mode gone? Is there no time-lapse mode in this camera? Yes, there is. There's sort of two modes, if you will. When it comes to photo time-lapse, it's in there. I'll put an overlay on the screen now showing you where it is in the menu. And then also S and Q mode, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you can go the opposite direction with SNQ. That's why it's called SNQ for slow and quick. Rather than just using higher frame rates and slowing them down, you can actually use lower frame rates and speed them up to sort of make sort of like a, a faster, faster video. That's like quick video, if you will. So that can work for like a time lapse purpose. And it has the photo mode one as well. See one here from Kevin, basic filmmaker. Is it A7S3, A7S? Oh. <laughs> It's got the different ways of formatting. It says, just want to see my name in lights. Well, there you go, Kevin. And the correct formatting is uh, lowercase a, capital seven, capital seven. <laughs> there's, no upper, there's no uppercase numbers. What are we doing here? <laughs> but that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, trust in the playback speed is 75%. Yeah, all right. I'm done.